Um, so just uh, to introduce myself and the movie a little bit, um, and then we can have some, a bit of Q&A. Um, hi, I'm Eugene, uh, Eugene Nolman. I'm a senior lecturer uh, in sociology at Vermont City University. Um, I work with Kahinda Andrews, who wrote the paper that this documentary film is based on. Um, it's a paper you can freely access um, and find online. If you have any trouble finding it, just get in touch. Um, and basically the paper started off looking at this concept of the psychosis of whiteness, this notion that um, not that uh, just that whiteness as in, in terms of white people, it's not really about white people, but it's about the construction of race and how that systemically and systematically um, produces uh, a particular type of racism that we experience today. But that racism isn't just one that no. is encapsulated within a national context in which um, there is a kind of racial hierarchy, if you will, but one that is international. And that's kind of what we try to say at the end of the film, um, and to emphasize that point here, I just wanted to say that that racism plays out even if you're in a country where there are, let's say, hypothetically, it doesn't exist, but let's say hypothetically, a country with only white people a country with only black people, a country with only Asian people, et cetera, right? Because the way that the international economy works um, is through, a racial, through racial capital, right? And that is constructing the problem of racism in itself. Um, it constructed it through uh, the slave trade, and it's constructing it today um, through neocolonialism. So um, I guess what, what I want to emphasize is that that that, that struggle to, to deal with the issue of racism is one that necessarily has to do with the international capitalist economy. All right, so that's what I wanted to emphasize um, with that. I think that's pretty much it. Um, any questions? I'm happy to answer. Yes, in the back? Hey, um, so I'm, I'm really interested in your thoughts around how your white privilege feeds into the narrative that's been constructed and been discussed in Kane Day's paper. Yeah, um, certainly, obviously, it means I'm more likely to have a job at a university or <laughs> be able to make a documentary film, etc. right? So I think that that uh, is certainly part of it and that's something that we can't uh, ignore. Um, but it's also about um, I guess the privilege is obviously there, and it's, it constructs the reality through which I'm looking at things. Um, but I think that it's important to also um, challenge ourselves, right? Um, and so I think that I've, I've been challenging myself with uh, looking at Kahin Dave's work and, and reading what he's writing and seeing um, how my uh, view of the world is, um, contained within my own positionality hmm. um, and how that can be expanded by and trying to incorporate other people's perspectives um, and ideas um, into my own. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hi, thank you. Um, so in the film, you looked at the disreinforcement of white power structures through the prism of, of film, e.g. slavery, and the focus has been on the British realm. I'm wondering if you had any thoughts or comments on American films that have dealt with the issue, particularly 12 Years a Slave, because I'm quite interested that it did come up in your film. That is a brilliant film, by the way, but I was so disappointed there was only this bit on 12 Years a Slave. And I'm wondering if you had any thoughts on how slavery has been represented in American films, particularly 12 Years of Slave. Sure, yeah. Um, one of the comments we get is that some people feel like we've given 12 years of slave a pass. And I can see where that confusion could be there, because basically the only time that we're representing it is in direct contrast with Bell, because they're very different movies. But it doesn't necessarily escape some of the problematics in there. Um, certainly, there's still an aspect of the white savior within that film as well. Um, it was, it's a bit um, harder to tackle because in my understanding, that is what happened. But obviously, 
these movies aren't always about representing the truth, as you can see, right? Yeah. They're clearly not. They're clearly constructed to do something else. And the stories that are, are picked to tell certain, um, to, ha to have these discussions, these kind of popular discussions about slavery and the slave trade um, are picked for a particular reason, right? Um, and, if, and if the reason doesn't, if the truth doesn't fit that reason, then you manipulate the truth mm. to reflect what they actually want to present. Uh, but 12 Years a Slave also had historical inaccuracies in, uh, in ways that um, are difficult, or I would say more difficult maybe, to present in a mainstream film that you want people to come and watch. And uh, we're used to a certain type of film where there's more action and there's a plot and there's things happening. Um, but one of the contrasts with uh, the kind of biographical accounts is that you didn't have time for the level of discussions that they had. It was just work, barely eat, sleep. Like, that was the life. And how do you represent that in a film that's trying to, um, I guess, fit a, a, a story, a, a plot, or a story, or a, a form of cinema that we're used to? And maybe it should, maybe it should challenge what we're used to, to really depict what is happening. Mm. Um, and that, maybe is the, the difficulty that we should be um, looking at. How you, you don't have the dialogue, all you have is suffering. And maybe it's worth, I mean, it's hard to, because you, there's you know some problem with representing um, these issues in that you're kind of exploiting that suffering in a way. Um, but it's always a challenge, I think, to make films like uh, but one of the reasons, sorry, just to get back to the, your general point, one of the reasons that we featured these films, and obviously Amistad was a Hollywood, Hollywood film, the two others British, um, the reasons that we picked these films is that we're specifically interested in the slave trade itself. And part of that is because of that um, international political economy focus that we wanted to give, um, which takes us out of the national um, focus of the issue of slavery which is often what happens in American films in particular, um, because obviously slavery occurred there in, in larger numbers. And all those films typically, you know, there's some discussion about it, maybe there's some brief moment about the trade itself, but usually it's focused on slavery that's happening there and it's missing out the reason in effect as to why there was even uh, a process of enslaving Africans. In your opinion, do you still think do you think education still plays a role in pushing that white savior job? Yeah, I mean there's definitely in what way, in what way do you feel Yeah, I mean it's education, are you thinking specifically like the school system? School. Because I think these yeah. films and even university, the whole yeah, yeah. FBH, the whole, the whole I think these films as well serve that function. And often we forget that unless you have a really critical lens on while you're watching it, sometimes this let this slips past us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and I think a lot of people who have no um, critical perspective on it will just accept all of these narratives. And those narratives come to construct what we think ought to happen, does happen, did happen. Mm. And that creates um, that is part, I think, of creating the, the privileges and the, uh, the racism that we see. So that continues then within our system. And, I, I, and certainly, I think, in the education system, you don't have a lot of the history yeah. being told. And within the university, it's usually very similar. There's at least a bit of scope if you have that knowledge. Um, but even Kehinde, uh, who is trying to bring this kind of uh, history to the fore, is saying a lot of the stuff he learned, he learned outside of those uh, of those institutions anyway, right? So, and obviously he's trying to bring it into the university, but for the most part, a lot of people will have to get that elsewhere.
which have so much money and funding behind them and promotion, how did it come to act? And how many other things are like this and where do you see them and why are they not pushed more? Or, yeah, like what is the case of funding and that in the Yeah, I mean, um, this is my first movie. This is definitely new to me. Um, our, what the process for us at the moment is logistically in terms of distribution is I set up like a free website on Wix and then I tweeted it. <laughs> and basically on that website, there's like a form you can fill out and if you're interested in, in hosting a screening, you just get in touch with me basically. And then I give you the film and you screen it and that's it. Um, so that's pretty much what it's been. And um, what is certainly, um, there, there's a certain positivity that you can find in the number of people interested in screening something like this, right? I mean, if they're interested based on the description and the, and the name and maybe the trailer, which is also on the website, um, and, but based on that, they seem there seems to be interest, and that interest comes from different places. This comes from the communities that are already um, understanding of some of these processes. It comes from academic communities that might be interested in some of the um, kind of theoretical arguments, like the notion of the psychosis of whiteness, but also from historians that are interested in how history is represented in these films, but also um, the kinds of uh, debunking in a way that we try to do in the film. Um, so there are definitely different communities that are interested in it, but yeah, it's, I mean, we could have made the title slightly more uh, accessible for people who don't already ha have like a critical notion of whiteness um, to begin with. Um, but on the other hand, it, it attracts people who are interested in it. And what we're trying to do is not necessarily, you know, uh, reinvent the wheel here or, or present the same information that you would have already thought of, but it is trying to challenge the movements um, within um, these kind of uh, activist communities or communities that are interested in these, po in these politics because of its uh, international anti-capitalist message that we tried to bring to the fore towards the end. Maybe we should have done, done a better job of that, but um, that's one of the things I think we're trying to bring to the table. Yeah? Uh, yeah. I really respect the intent, um, but for me personally, I was very disappointed to write a letter of analysis in the film. Okay. Um, so for example, um, when talking about psychotic behavior, um, for me, Frances Cress Wilding is the definitive source. She's the person who has completely analyzed um, the, the, the insanity of European thinking, particularly when it comes to race, that how it, it, has, it makes no logical sense whatsoever, and it affords mental illness. So that was missing for me, and that was very disappointing. Secondly, um, I also think that it's time that academics stop talking about slavery, as in the enslavement of African people is the only form of slavery. And what it does is it, it re-traumatizes African people when that single perspective is always presented and it almost puts the concept of slavery for us as African people out of context. I'm not saying that ours wasn't a particularly brutal form of enslavement, but it wasn't the only form of enslavement. And by constantly revisiting, to me, it keeps us in this cycle of PSDT, which Joseph is really talked about a lot. And I think if we are going to talk about it, academics should be using the language enslavement and not slavery, as if we are defined by slavery. And as um, Sinclair said, I think it's Sinclair, um, or might be an Ecuador, I can't remember, he was a prince. And those films never feature Africa pre-enslavement. It's as if we had no industry, and if we had no cities, we had no civilization. And we know, as from Diop's seminal work, Africa is the mother of world civilization. So, and again, I think that needed to be present in your analysis, that that is completely ignored, that Africa contributed anything to civilization, so therefore it's fine and acceptable for there to be this constant discourse about us as something that can be owned and something that's savage. But you have to balance that, and if you're not talking about the, the civilization, which is in Africa now and was in Africa, again, it re-traumatizes Africans, 
And I'm thinking because I'm from an educational background, I don't want my students to see this documentary because it doesn't present balance. And the last point for me is, well, two, two points, is the film talked a lot about the minimi minimization of the African boys, and I felt African academics were not present enough in this analysis. And I felt they were sort of tucked in towards the end and didn't have a large enough voice. So that was very contradictory for me. Uh, and, and finally, I would say that um, if we're not also looking at films like the recent Nat Turner film, which was self-financed by Africans, we're never going to be looking at films which present a balanced perspective because the psychosis is built into the white Western psyche. And people like Spielberg, we can't possibly expect them to represent the true suffering and the true history of African people because he's been educated from a particular perspective. So we can't, why would we expect him to represent something truthfully? Well, I guess I think somebody, not with me, disagree, but he's saying how, um, as you say, it wasn't a balance, no. No, but this balance. film was just looking at one aspect of, of, of the history of, you know, what's happened to us, but you're kind of highlighting. But I, I really want the response from okay, the director. Okay, so I just thought you'd say. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I take. Um, most of your points, I think um, one of the reasons that um, we do uh, discuss slavery, the enslavement of Africans in particular, in, in the, without contextualizing it across slavery more broadly, is because that unlike other forms of slavery, um, including, we could say, slavery less brutal forms on the continent of Africa. But it is the mechanism by which we in this country have the wealth that we have now, and in the States, and the rest of Europe. And it's constructed the reality in which we live in. And that reality, to, um, to kind of answer another question, is, is one in which we are all somewhat trapped in the psychosis of whiteness, not just white. Um, so Kahende's argument is even he himself is trapped in that psychosis because we basically have to blind ourselves constantly from the reality of what the situation is. Uh, child dies, uh, well, one child dies every 10 seconds from hunger, right? Uh, because of the capitalist system we're in. Not because we don't have enough food, because of the economic system. And we all, at, at some point, um, Kind so of are you saying block that, that, that out. Socialism, socialism does not have to deal with racism because when I listen to the so called justice Democrats in the States, for example, because obviously the presidential election is coming up in 2020, and for the first time, center stage is the issue of reparations. Neither capitalists, neither um, the conservatives, the American Republican Federation of Conservatives, nor the justice Democrats fully, properly support the concept of reparations. And to me, that's an issue of racism. So I don't buy into this concept that it's about capitalism. It's about a mental illness. It is a, it, the word is psychosis, that's absolutely right, that you use, which doesn't allow people to think clearly and be honest. Dr. Marianne Williams is the only person at the moment who is saying that $10 billion, which is ne can, we can never be comp compensated, as far as I'm concerned, Africans for the trauma, the brutality, and the devastation that has taken place in Bikini for decades. We can never be financially compensated. But if we're going to start, okay, 10 billion is, some, is somewhere to start over 10, 20 years. She's the only person at the moment out of the field of 25, probably, probably, probably about 25 different um, um, presidential hopefuls who's, who's prepared to seriously discuss the issue of reparations. So but, it's got nothing to do with capitalism. That's fine, capitalism. but it's not going to happen in a way. Like that, I mean, A, actual reparations would basically mean the um, United States would be indebted by trillions, probably. Um, if you look at the numbers, it's a ridiculous amount that no country can afford. Um, but also, you can't expect that to happen um, within a system that in but which... But that's not my point. It's not about my expectation of whether it happens 
Yeah, hi. Um, I, uh, to give you a bit of background, I come from a country it's called Southern Cameroons. Um, Southern British Cameroons is actually um, called. And it's still enslaved or in slavery um, as I speak and write to you right, <clears throat> right now. And if I was to call home, you'd probably hear gunshots. And that's the legacy of decolonization policies. So the question I asked, one of the symptoms you identified there was in terms of the narrative, the various different films that are out there in terms of the media are written and directed from a wide perspective and position it in a very specific way. Now, looking at your narrative, uh, you mentioned earlier on that Kehinde wrote it. I've actually met him. I, I met him in Be <coughs> Birmingham at the Pan-African Conference. Now, at that conference, there was a question a man asked. How many of you in this room actually do any work in Africa today? And in that regard, having watched that film as an African and explaining what I've just explained, can you tell me how that represents me? And in which way you've spoken about white psychosis in a very white way from my perspective. And what I would like to see is what is the black perspective in regards to white psychosis in that? I mean, in a way, um, it's, it's quite hard for me to, to answer that question, I think, because for the most part, I'm just drawing on what Kehinde wrote in terms of the analysis, right? Right. Um, Do you think that is sufficient as a piece of research to then make a film that states white psychosis, or is that a very narrow way and therefore lacking in terms of your research about what psychosis may actually mean? I mean, it, it, in a way, we can argue about how to use the metaphor of psychosis to explain racism in different ways. Okay. I'm sure we could. Um, I think Hinde was trying to present uh, one particular way of, lo of looking at that, which is that we have these hallucinations in terms of these films. We can talk about all sorts of other films that are not historical. We can talk about all sorts of forms of other culture, just thinking process in general. So films, in a way, are just the case study that we're using for the purpose of okay. the paper and the documentary. Um, but I guess the talking more about the point of um, uh, countries in Africa, the decolonial experience, um, etc. It's really about um, how that ties in to the current economic system, which I think is still uh, maintaining those relations, even if we want to pretend, I mean, that a particular form of, of that slavery is over, let's say. Um, and so I think that's where that link can be made, but maybe we didn't make it enough. But, but it is what I'm trying to say is it's not over and that may directly yeah, yeah, speak yeah. to current white psychosis as, we, as it is now and more prevalent um, than what that film may depict in terms of its narrative. Uh, yeah, it's not over. Like, there's a lot of documentaries that happen here. Like, there's a co colony in South Africa to 36 people. Sure. It's an English company. Mm -hmm. But I think us as well, as black people, when it's a fight, we're never going to get a group. Because how are we going to spread, spread it between each other? Well, if we don't that have, enough, if we don't have alone, acknowledgement... That alone is argument. We deal with Black History Month of October. You are enslaving yourself every time. That comes up every time. You're going through it again and again and again. Before I come to this country, I never heard of it. I've come from Nigeria. Like, are we, like you read about slavery, you're empowered, you're happy, you're fine. You remember Jaja Bobo, Bishop Ajay Carter. You come here, you heard of a man, man of King God that was killed by white people. Malcolm X killed by white people. Everybody is killed by someone. That's what you're dealing with. That's what you get fed every time. And we take it in every time. We take it in, we take it in. We're not trying to open our mind. That's why I see from, we could sit here and fight each other every day. We could do this every day, but until we learn to start changing our mind and how we deal with things, we'll never change. You can say why, like I sit at home, they turn on the light. Ah, oh, thank God for white people. Did you research who created the light bulb? You don't see, things like that. All those little things, it's about us like empowering ourselves and not blaming the other people every time. 
You can blend the people forever, and you'll never get out. I, I would agree with you, and I completely agree with you, and I'm not coming from that perspective. What I'm looking at is I come from a country whereby this is happening, <coughs> and therefore the psychosis is very live. Mm -hmm. Now, that's one country, and I could probably give you a list of four. You named a few just there. It's not in this video, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so if we can't acknowledge it and fully acknowledge it when we're putting things live and publicly, then it's very difficult to see how this is going to really unravel the true depth and what white psychosis may or may not be. And that's the point I was trying to make. Sequel. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, in a way, like, I, I totally take your point. Um, I, and I take a lot of your points. And I think that there's, there's room here for other people to, to, to go off and, and do similar things in a different way, right? Um, even maybe contest the representation here. The representation for the representation. Um, uh, there's definitely scope for that. And to be honest, um, it's not like we had a big budget or anything to make this documentary. Sure. You can probably tell from some of the uh, not perfect audio recording of the interviews. But, um, you know, if you, if you want to, you can do a similar thing and tell those stories. And, and that what is what becomes important, I think, um, is telling those stories and having that discussion and bringing out that up um, in these spaces. Sure. I mean, this is a life, it seems like a sugar-coated version, that's all. Um, in terms of the depth in which it's gone, because if you, if you ask Africans in Africa today about white psychosis, mm -hmm. I think you may find it's a lot stronger um, in terms of content. Um, than, than what I've seen, but maybe that's just my perspective and opinion. Yeah, but in a way, I think I think that is because we've not realized that colonialism is still happening, and I think that's a big a big part. Cognitive of, dissonance. Sorry, cognitive <laughs> dissonance. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean that's part of the with the the metaphor that Kahende is trying to use in his paper, right? Um, it's it's this idea. You know, Britain and slavery. The US ended slavery. It's over. And that's that's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. So is it, would you say, as you mentioned this night, that Colonia has finished? Is that, is those films that were made, is that a continuation of, of, recon, of, of a conditioning that's in the mind of the general public? To, to the idea that it's over? Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and I think that that's something that's internalized. And in a way, again, it's something that we often internalize as well, um, because on a daily basis we almost do it as a, a way of surviving. If we kept thinking, "Shit, this is still happening. What are we going to do about it?" You either start a revolution or you keep going with, on with your life, right? And so I think that's part of the the psychosis, and I think that that's why. Kahinde says, look, I, he's suffering from the, it too. He, it's not like he's free from that concept just because he's invented the, the term in, in that uh, respect. Does that make sense? So um, I think that's a big, I think that's a big part of it. Can I just ask a question to kind of maybe in front of you were speaking about um, capitalism and socialism. I kind of agree to an extent, not, I'm not sure what my beliefs are exactly on socialism and capitalism, but it kind of, the idea that ending capitalism would end slavery to me ties into the, the prospect in the film or the aspects of the film where you talk about uh, people using class to kind of over mm -hmm. override race and it's as if to say if there was no class structure there would be no racism but mm -hmm. like you said racism is in everywhere in the world and even if there was a country where everyone happened to be of one race there would still be some form of oppression so I kind of think that that argument of it is capitalism that creates racism is another form of white psychosis and white oppression mm -hmm. and uh, of trying to uh, shift the blame. Um, especially if you come from a working class background, it's easy to shift the blame onto the people at the top. But then we see that the people at the bottom are as much uh, part of that system. Yeah, I think, so Kahinde's point around this um, is, yeah, that you have you're gonna have prejudice that might continue maybe forever. He's a black nationalist, so he just views get all black people together. You know how to deal with that in a way. Um, all sorts of other things can happen in that context. I don't necessarily subscribe to that um, idea. It's not that um, inherently uh, getting rid of capitalism is gonna get rid of racism. 
is that it's a precondition because the real um, basis of racism is the international political economy, the way in which uh, racial capitalism functions, and in the way in which that functions both in an international and national level. Um, and that becomes the reason why uh, one uh, child dies from starvation every 10 seconds, right? Um, and that is what he's pointing out is uh, really the racism as a systemic form of oppression comes from, rather than, um, I don't know, someone doesn't like someone else because of the, only because of the color of their skin, etc. right? Um, and I think that that's what he's trying to pinpoint. Um, and not, obviously it doesn't mean that all of that goes away. And obviously you can have systems that don't contain um, a capitalist economic uh, formulation, uh, but still exhibit systemic forms of racism in those ways as well. But, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, although we can argue whether China is actually uh, uh, capitalist or not. But yeah, there it has to be a, a system in which um, in which uh, the entire international system um, stops working where in a way in which Africa essentially is a source of all the resources we have. Um, they get exploited by largely Western corporations in which the Western corporations make money and we get that, some of it through taxes, whatever, we get those benefits in the UK, in the US, throughout Western Europe, and Africa gets nothing in effect. And then we ship all of our pro uh, production to Asia, but most of the production, the most of the value from that production is coming back here, right? Um, and that is the real um, kind of international system of racism, right? That's structural. And without removing those, uh, figuring out how to get rid of those pieces, the big structural uh, kind of international forms of, of racism aren't going to go away. And until you have that, Africa will still be poor, um, and you'll have these problems in which we're not seeing the value of Africa, right? Because we don't value it. We or we value it only to the uh, to the extent that we make profit off it. We being the West, right? And that's part of the question. Um, about I have quite a lot of what most of everyone has said here. I just wanted to ask, what has been the reception? from some of your white counterparts in terms of this film and what are some of the kind of obstacles or criticisms that you face from your white counterparts? Yeah, I mean, it's a hard one because again, like the people who are gonna come and watch it are typically people who agree. And honestly, I sometimes I expect like a neo-Nazi or two to show up or something, but it hasn't happened yet. So I think for the most part, people have, um, accepted it, think that it's fine, um, uh, accept the arguments that are being presented, I mean. Um, but those are people who are already willing to come and see a film about whiteness that clearly is going to be critical of it, right? Did uh, you say that you are um, studying at university? No, I'm a senior lecturer at okay. Birmingham City. So for, okay, so your white counterparts who are aware of the fact that you're making, or have made this film, what has their, what's their reaction been towards it? Um, I think that they, so, some of them, depending on who, who it is, would just be like, okay, well I have to ignore this fact about me, right? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, certainly institutionally, not much support. I kind of hid the name for as long as I could in terms of making it. And um, what's the reason behind that? Um, the institution is racist. <laughs> I mean, for the most part, as you find in the hierarchies of most institutions, it, it's going to be typically male, typically white, and they're gonna have those perspectives that we talked about, sorry. Ten minutes, ten minutes, all right, sorry, thanks. Yeah, sorry, does that answer your question? It does, I just yeah. find it interesting that, um, you know, obviously you need to hide the name or not disclose the name, for obvious reasons I get, but it's kind of that, that difficult space that I guess you find yourself in, um, but, I guess essentially if your story is about truth then and you're trying to reach I don't know some of the people who are less aware or more, the more uneducated people in 
the society, for, for example, wouldn't it be your responsibility to highlight these things and to not kind of... Yeah, I mean, I guess my strategy, I guess my strategy was make the film first and then try to get them in the room. Um, and if I couldn't make the film because they heard the name of what we were planning to call it, um, I don't know if it would have been better or worse. But yeah, I think it's fine. Yeah. Can I just ask one further question sure. about your background and how you, your journey to getting interested in this subject area? Yeah, um, um, I don't know how far back it goes. Um, or how, yeah, I mean, I was involved in um, the Southern California Anarchist Federation, um, which was a very, like a, <coughs> Uh, range of people, different people, um, with different perspectives. Um, and that was the most intersectionally aware space I've, I've been in. And that was during my teenage years, basically. So fairly formative in my uh, notions of um, right and wrong, I guess, um, and how to do politics. Um, and I, I entered that space because I was interested in um, justice, and that interest was always broad and never about a particular group of people. Or um, so I was always open to that um, notion. And I myself, although I'm from the United States, I was an immigrant to the United States, even though I moved when I was two. I came from the Soviet Union um, to the United States at the age of two, basically being a, a kind of refugee because. They were institutionally uh, racist or prejudiced if, um, against Jews, um, so my family had fled, and that was the kind of context and the and the mindset and the positionality that I was coming from. And then obviously other people don't have the same trajectory as me in terms of their politics or notions, um, but I think that's part of the story. <coughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Um. T two things. Firstly, I'd like to reinforce um, a point you made and a very important one I think Kahindi made, and I'm not sure it comes through it in the video, um, about the capitalism um, element in all of this. Um, I, I work as a, used to work as an investment broker, stockbroker okay. um, in London, so I'm quite familiar with the background behind the FTSE 100. And what I wanted to say was the list of names in those companies, I'd encourage anyone um, to go and look at those names and look at how they started because it will give a clear indication of your cars, your drinks, your houses, everything you own, cultivating and adding to the problem, which reinforces what the gentleman was saying earlier on. And I just wanted to add that in there because I think it's the most significant point um, that I took away from that video, and thank you for pointing it out. Thanks, yeah, and, and really one of my biggest regrets in the film is that we didn't talk more directly about that for a longer period of time. And I mean, some of you may have been falling asleep already, so I don't know if we wanted it to be longer, but yeah. Um, definitely, I would have wanted to highlight that, that point that you made. Just to reinforce, if you go to Bermondsey and you stand in West Indo Keys um, in the summer, it's on a very hot day, you can actually smell cinnamon and sometimes honey off the building. Now, that should give you an indication um, to that. Yeah, I, was, I guess I might um, work with what came to mind through some of that. of the white supremacists and I was just thinking about um, white identity and that, that wasn't kind of mentioned and I, I guess I just have some curiosities about you know this big celebration you know the, the abolition of the straight, uh, slave trade um, for 150 years um, and that kind of perpetuation of we are the savior and that kind of inability to confront the con cognitive dissonance and like what does that say about you know, how people cling to that, how white, you know, white people in this country um, kind of cling to that identity of, you know, we are kind of the saviors of the world, we are, you know, the, at the same time sort of celebrating empire, you know, we're celebrating the fact that we, um, you know, the trade, slave trade was abolished. Um, and yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, I guess I just wonder about the function of that, really, and that, and that you know, without that, like, what is left? And I think it 
What have you enjoyed um, mm -hmm. with this whole process? I mean, it's obviously your work. Has there been any benefits so far out of it, non-financial, or anything you can take away from it, as in you've spoken to a white person that may have had a psychosis, wasn't aware, and they've become enlightened. Has any of that happened? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a tough one. I mean, I think part of the Kenyan is already that you can't escape the psychosis. Um, you can't really um, properly escape it, let's say. There might be momentary moments of sanity or something, um, but it, until you get rid of the, the uh, it, not the symptom, but the cause, uh, that you can't really escape. And so I think he is less hopeful about what the possibilities of the film could be in a way. Um, but I think certainly my, the thing that I enjoy most are these discussions generally. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, there's no real financial benefit. We're trying to recoup the cost of making the film itself. Um, but um, in other screenings that are going to take place, um, it's like, you know, the Burning Grant Art Center is making money out of this. But uh, we're not. Uh, but obviously, it's a good institution to support, so I don't feel bad about that. I just want to call yeah. So, um, since you've made this, yeah. do you get a lot of people asking? So spin it as, as is it gets spinning in a lot of places. Yeah, there's quite a few screenings lined up. A few more in London. Uh, some in uh, one in Glasgow, one in Edinburgh. Another place in Scotland. I can't recall at the moment. Um, we're getting French subtitles for it as well because there's a press in France. So and in the states, um, one school is considering adopting it for their curriculum. That have a bit more flexibility curriculum in the States. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely been interest, and there has been basically no advertising. Um, so it's really interesting how the idea of it is spreading and how interest around it is, um, uh, I, guess, I guess, reaching different uh, people in different places. How can we help you spread the film? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, right now what we're doing is, is just uh, having screenings for it. Um, we'll try to distribute it uh, at some point later on, I think, uh, freely, probably. Um, like, just asking for a donation, but generally allowing anyone to download it. I think we're going in that direction, but um, at the moment we're trying to do screening, so if anyone knows anyone or can host a screening or has any interest in that, get in yeah. touch. Yeah? Yes. All right. Yeah, we've heard about that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.